First of all, thanks again for agreeing to give that presentation. Uh, good to see you again. And um, yeah, we, we know each other for quite some time. Um, I remember the days when you did your PhD at Imperial College. Um, and now, of course, you are at the University of Hong Kong, um, associate professor. And uh, uh, yeah, also great that we were able to, to keep the, the contact over the years and continue to collaborate. And I definitely would like to also continue along those lines. Um, yeah, and uh, Kawai has been really um, instrumental in pushing forward uh, robotics in the in the medical field, and uh, uh, very similar to to my work, also interested in um, work relating to um, soft robotic structures and flexible structures and how they can be used in a in a medical context. Um, yep, you can put an L there, Q, Q M U L. <laughs> the, the Queen University of London. UL, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good. Um, just, just give me, just give me one second. I, I see Elena has been joining. Elena de Momi. Um, just wanted to say hi to her. Hi, Elena. How are you doing? I, I thought I saw her joining. No, yeah, no. she did join. Yeah, she did join. You don't have a microphone, but yeah, okay. But you, you, you're not talking today, or are you? I'm confused now. Because I, I thought there were only presentations by Kawai today and Paolo Fiorini. And you, you cannot speak because you don't have a microphone. So that's okay yeah. then. Anyways, thanks for joining. Uh, good to have you also that's here cool. in the session. Um, just want to say hi. Fantastic. Yeah, and please do stay. Um, yeah, great to have you on board. Um, okay. Over to Kawai. Uh, thanks again. Okay. And, yeah, stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Kasper, for your very kind introductions. Um, sorry that I I did just at uh, talk title a bit. So right now. Um, uh, more make it more specific to spec uh, flexible sensing and attraction because uh, some of the work I also collaborate with uh, Casper and then that would be nice to to give you some update result to the student here. Um, but in general, I would not uh, just focus on the our research update. I hope at the very beginnings, I will also talk about uh, our insight on the uh, surgical robotics development. Uh, so um, that's why this is the topics for today. Okay, so uh, just just a very brief introduction of my team. Uh, my 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 team my group is called Interventional Robotics and Imaging System Iris. So if you like to explore more about my work, you can you can go to this website or just search Iris HKU. You will definitely uh, reach to my website. Basically, there's a five uh, components uh, over the last X years. Uh, I I have uh, spent a lot of effort to engage in these five components. First of all, I'm a, uh, I can say I'm a control people. Uh, I start learning automation since my undergraduate study, and then um, right now even we have some research on 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 this part which is uh, more or less uh, theoretical, more fundamental, involve fundamental mathematics. It supports a lot of uh, application oriented work. Uh, for example, the robotics control, soft robotics, and the levitation system involve disturbance. And then also uh, based on the control uh, performance, we know how to verify the robotics uh, attribution for performance, and then we can build things step by step without um, without much failure at the end. So this is the fundamental uh, work to to make every single step successful and before before building our system. So finally, uh, uh, basically I have a lot of research focus on on the MI guided robotics. I will I will go through it later on. But before uh, going deep to some specific topics about flexible device, MR guided robotics, and also flexible attribution. Uh, I guess uh, 
this is also good timings to introduce world first uh, surgical robot on human uh, that was developed by Professor Brian Staves uh, at Imperial. Uh, at that time, they called Pobot. It was the first robot to remove patient tissue, post, uh, prostate tissue from a human. Uh, that trial was carried out in 1991. So uh, later on, there's a very uh, well-known uh, robot prototype, which is called uh, Aquabot, which is particularly used for the total knee replacement. Uh, so the idea is that um, uh, instead of having a remote control of robot like Da Vinci, uh, at that time, the robot conduct a collaborative control. That means uh, there's a robotic manipulator. The surgeons uh, need to hold the, the handles. So there's a both hand maneuvering the handle. One is the surgeon's hand, the other is the robot hand, so that they collaborating, cooperating with a single task to to do the tissue cutting, bone cut, bone tissue cutting on the knee joint. So the idea is that um, we we uh, we try to have a robot to to guide the the surgeons to to draw a straight line to cut a bone in a very accurate manner, in a very accurate shape. Uh, like the idea, uh, I I taught my daughter to write try this character somehow. Uh, she don't know how to articulate those kind of stroke. Uh, we will both we will somehow uh, hold hold her hand to to demonstrate and then let he let her know the feelings haptic feelings. So a uh, similar concept, but uh, basically uh, is a ruler is a virtual ruler. Uh, if you write a strict line on the paper without any tools, you you cause a lot of cognitive burden to maintain the line more or less on the reference line. On the reference point, but with the ruler, uh, is a is a mechanical fixture. You can you can draw a straight line easily by by the fixture, uh, guiding by the fixture. So the robot provide a kind of virtual fixture, active constraint, to let you sense the boundary of the of the uh, uh, cutting shape. So um, later on, there's a a lot of robot. Uh, employ the similar control concept, uh, also interact a kind of uh, haptics so that the surgeons uh, can position the tools on the on the uh, anatomical uh, site, anatomical chart target very well. So this is uh, somehow the robot can divide the cutting plane uh, so that this is the, the slot, virtual slot, uh, so-called virtual fixture. Uh, every access of the tools will, will align on that 2D plane. So this is a very uh, um, a typical uh, virtual fixture that could be employed in the uh, totally or partially replacement. Um, so if I'm going to show you some more videos, this is a rather uh, gruesome. Uh, this, this involves some uh, uh, surgical procedure. Um, how? Let me mute the sound. Um, so, uh, the, the the knee joint need to mount it with the optical marker on the knee. This is an invasive uh, optical marker. Uh, so the knee joint configuration has been registered on the surgical plan. Oh, sorry, it jumped too quick. Okay, let me. Uh, so the idea is that. Uh, with the lead joint uh, register with the surgical plan, with the surgical navigations, with the CT image, uh, you you will you will uh, the computer can help you to monitor the cutting progress. So uh, the idea is that we have to pave, we have to cut the slot, prepare the the the, the cutting slot, so so that the prosthesis uh, can be can be packed in to the lead joint. Uh, with with this uh, appropriate socket uh, shape. So I would like to show you this video is that when the patient knee joint register well with the uh, CT images, the computer can estimate how how much bone joint, how much bone tissue has been destroyed uh, in real time. This is a, a kind of uh, estimation. And then also uh, not just the surface, 
uh, if we want to plug in the with those two socket hole because uh, there's a two two neck uh, um, like a a female and male socket. Uh, now the surgeon have to prepare the female socket on the joint, and then so that the male socket of the of this can can secure on that slot uh, firmly. So that kind of procedure need to have a very high accurate uh, uh, incisions, uh, bone cuttings. With the robot, we we fo foresee that uh, the robot can be a virtual guidance, provide a virtual fixture so that. The surgeons can can sense the haptic interaction resistance, uh, and also a kind of uh, interaction force when particularly the, when the when the bone drill is penetrated deeper to some forbidden regions. So uh, this is a, a a kind of procedure, uh, typically a very typical one uh, that um, is having a very uh, use uh, take use of a very good uh, uh, robot features. To, to make it accurate. So uh, later on, uh, beyond the orthopedics, uh, orthopedics is a very uh, demanding procedure, demanding for uh, precision. But when we come back to the soft tissue, and uh, another typical example, which is the robotics uh, labor laparoscopy is a, uh, procedure, uh, uh, this is a very famous uh, Da Vinci, even in UK or in Hong Kong, there's a uh, many cases carried out over the last uh, decade. Uh, the idea is that um, uh, the the ro robot can can directly maneuver, uh, remotely control the elevator of the robot. So when we compare to the manual uh, procedure, uh, this is the manual setting of the laparoscopy. Uh, how the surgeons holding the the camera, the the strict rigid scope, and then also the another hand, the other hands holding the laparoscopic instrument. So, um, not just only uh, that will totally occupy, fully occupy two hands, uh, and then somehow we need four hands. The idea is that the Falcom effect, uh, which is taking place in the in the Falcom point, uh, making the the input motion totally reverse. So for many version, for many version, when you move the hand to left, the antifactor will be moving to the right. So uh, the hand moving up, the antifactor will be moving down. So it takes a lot of training time to let the surgeons to get used to that kind of visual disorientation. Um, and for simple motion mapping, which is fine, but in, while the task involves complicated maneuvering, like uh, suturing, uh, it, it will take longer uh, learning curve to to know how to articulate those kind of uh, skills. So here to the right hand side, you will see a, make, a big difference. Uh, robotics versions, uh, robotics laparoscopy by Da Vinci. Uh, you can see both hand, the below is the human hand, the above is the robot hand. You can see uh, they are, the, the control mapping, the control direction, which is quite consistent. Uh, uh, you can see the all the direction orientation of the motion is consistent with each other. And then you just need to think about the 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 the, uh, the end effect of the robot, the tip of this instrument. And then the successful features of Da Vinci at that time over the computer motion, the other company also make a uh, lapar laparoscopy. One of the Spectacular feature is that they have an endo wrist, uh, so as to mimic the 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 hand wrist of human. So uh, the 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 mapping is very the control mapping is very ergonomics. So you can see here, uh, four instrument uh, going inside to the ad abdominal cavities, and then. Uh, four instrument can only be to con control by one surgeon, and they have the clutch to switch on and switch off uh, either one of the tools, so that uh, they can they can have a lot of uh, different versatile manipulation on the tissue involved, suturing, diaphragmy, tissue retractions, also the triangulation of the tissue for ease of diaphragmy, 
So this is a very versatile uh, manipulation for, for laparoscopy. Somehow they will allow two surgeons each control two arm, in total four arms uh, uh, insert to the be belly uh, uh, abdominal cavities. So, so when they usually, uh, even manual or robot, they will have to insufflate the cavity so as to create much more uh, a workspace. The idea is that pump in more CO2 gas so that they can create bigger uh, feeding volumes for the robotics uh, uh, manipulation, similar idea to the manual version. So uh, this is so-called the advancement of the robotic surgery. And then I would like to take the chance to introduce that timeline. Uh, I usually use the mobile phone development as an analogy. And right now, if you ask similarly, where are we in robotic surgery? I can say Da Vinci is similar to something we, we used in the mobile phone uh, that was in 1980s. Very bulky, big size, um, only uh, uh, decided for particular kind of procedure and also very expensive. So this is a similar features of, of our mobile phone in 1980s, also in a very big size. Function is only for uh, phone dial up, no internet, uh, no game, no even no phone address book uh, can store the phone number. Um, so purely only for uh, dialing com communications, phone call. So uh, we still have a long way to go if we follow the uh, the timeline of the mobile phone industry very well, we, we will have a very uh, bright future of surgical robotics. This is a kind of encouragement to the young generation. Uh, please join us uh, because uh, this is a very uh, a bright future to, to, to engage in the surgical robotics uh, development. So we have a lot of things we can improve, for example, uh, how to make the system, make the tools even further feasible for more feasible access to some more procedure that require minimally invasive uh, procedure. This is kind of the topics I would like to uh, uh, go through uh, today. So um, before, uh, so the, all, all the previous uh, robotics procedure uh, I, I have introduced, which is heavily reliant on camera. So we also the neck eye uh, for orthopedics. Uh, you can see directly on the surgical site. The uh, you can you can touch the the bit, uh, bone joint. For uh, robotics laparoscopy, all the vision is transmitted from the camera inside the body to the outside to the console. So somehow there might have some other. Uh, vision, visual modality we can use. That's why a uh, few years, ago, uh, eight years ago, I start learn a new imaging modality to me, which is the MRI. Um, so you can see uh, the MRI, which is a very advanced uh, imaging modality, can provide a very high temporal resolution imaging. And even the MRI can, can give you a heat map heat map. He can monitor the temperature. He can see the temperature throughout the bodies. So here is an example. Uh, there's a little uh, passing through a bird hole to the deep brain regions. And the needle would, would also have the RF electrode at the, at the tip. So the, the needle transfers some uh, electrical re uh, resonant uh, electricity to heat up the certain regions. So you can see uh, uh, the warmer the color is higher the temperature. Uh, even the, not just the temperature itself, we can even uh, can do a post ablation evaluation. What does it mean? Uh, this is another procedure for electrophysiology, uh, particularly the treatment to heart rhythm disorder. We need the catheter to deliver the heat energy, pinpoint a particular area to make a scar on the in, uh, in inside the inner wall of the atrium or, or ventricle. So uh, uh, the, the scar can be even visualized by MRI. So the surgeons can know how much energy has been absorbed by the tissue. 
and so that it would not just an edema. We, we, they, they can ensure this is a scar so that the scar can uh, can have success uh, effectively block the irregular electricity signals. Uh, that abnormal electricity signal actually affect the heart uh, beating uh, motions. So this is the idea how MRI can monitor the, the ablation effect. So, but the, the, the downside is that MRI has to generate a very strong static magnetic fields. Uh, typically 1.5 Tesla to uh, 3 Tesla. Only 1.5 Tesla will be already sufficient enough to, to suck the wheelchair or hospital back to the donut. So this is, if you search the keywords MRI accident, you will find a, a lot of similar picture, how people misuse the MRI system. And that could be very dangerous uh, if there's a patient inside the, the ISO center, inside the donut. So um, there's a lot of consideration if we want to make a robot operate inside the MRI. So uh, although MRI can provide a very good eyes to, to see through the bodies and then naturally to monitor the, the surgical outcome. Let me. So um, over the last eight years, my team's focus on uh, three aspects for MRI guided robotics. Uh, first of all, we have to uh, ensure the actuation is effective. Also, that has to be safe. That means the conventional EM motor cannot put inside to the MRI environment. So the EM motor has to put outside the MRI environment, which is so-called a control room, to transmit the motion inside to the MRI room. So we usually use the hydraulics actuation, hydraulics transmission, which is because hydraulics uh, uh, transmission uh, with, for example, with water, with other uh, uh, sodium water, that would be very clean to the uh, EM, EM interference. So we ensure no EM interference were induced to the MRI images. Secondly, uh, we not, uh, uh, rather than actuation, we, if we want to uh, develop or design a robot, we need sensor, we need control, we need the positional tracking. So our teams also pay a lot of effort to develop some uh, 3D tracking marker that has to be wireless, that has to be very small, could be integrated uh, easily on the, on the uh, medical instrument. And combine two things together, the robot uh, can be operated inside the MRI coordinate system. So before, without this uh, checker, we don't know where is the robot until we can see the image. But when we see the image, where is the robot somehow that could not be very accurate, and then that involves a lot of latency. So that's why we need a marker that can real time to streamline, stream out the data with 3D coordinate to the system. And other thing is that, uh, the donut is very small. The, the MRI uh, circle is actually very small. Even we have to make a robot smaller than some coil. For example, for neural procedure, for neural surgery, uh, we need to have an extra head coil to cover the patient. Therefore, we have to make the robot even smaller uh, than the head coil so that the head coil can accommodate the full, uh, the entire robot system. So uh, that is involved a lot of lot of challenging uh, challenges. For example, a compact design of the robot, the actuation has to be very safe. Uh, involve hydraulics and also the sensing, positional checking, and then control has to be has to be conducted in, in a very real time manner. So uh, our team developed a kind of hydraulic system. Uh, you can see. Uh, uh, the the transmission can be passing through a 10 meter hydraulic uh, pipeline, and then uh, one side will be pushing by the electrical motor, and the through the pipelines, 10 meter pipelines, the the other uh, uh, unit we will put it inside to the MRI room will be the part of the robot. So we have a, uh, a leader and follower control. Uh, concept here. And we have to maintain the friction in a very low level. We use a rolling diaphragm uh, to reduce all the sliding 
uh, fictions. So we are the first group to uh, develop a kind of high performance uh, by directional motor. Um, someone told me that, is it possible to make a Da Vinci inside the MRI? Yes, possible if we have a light motor, uh, provide sufficient degree of freedoms. But the problem is that that mechanically is also challenging because uh, you have to make it very small. Um, but the other problem is that uh, it quite depends on the application, uh, whether we really need the laparoscopy procedure under the MRI. But mostly important is that why we use MRI, which is because we want to monitor the ablation. We want to monitor the laser hitting on some tissue, we want to see how much tissue has been destroyed in a very safe surgical margins. So is the, this is the major uh, purpose of MRI more than the, uh, uh, somehow that would be neural position in very good sense. Um, so another actuation uh, method, which is very popular recently in the recent uh, decade, which is the soft robotics, which is because uh, uh, the uh, the robot most of the robot is also uh, uh, fluid driven. They will uh, heavily relies on the uh, fluid pressure to drive the robot motion to drive the change of robot morphology. So here is the uh, 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 kind of extra example. We develop a a two uh, one well, two kind of interesting robot. Uh, the size is similar to the human fingers. Uh, we can. Uh, suppress a very strong pressure, which is up to six bar, to lift up a kind of loading that is around four four hundred fifty gram, uh, similar to a one can of Coca Cola. Uh, the weight, I mean, uh, so that is unbelievably unbelievably strong. If we can, uh, do a very good EV EV enforcement on the on the uh, structure, uh, six bar is a quite Quite much, uh, because the the vehicle tie pressure will typically maintain two point eight bar only the normal vehicle. So uh, uh, this is a very uh, a good benchmark. Uh, the robot can endure a very high pressure, and we even can prove it uh, for a a better uh, locomotion or manipulation. Uh, but this example, which doesn't contain any uh, sensor, so this is all in open loop control. So you can see even in an open loop control manner, uh, the robot can be performed in a very good repeatabilities. Um, so apart from the actuation, uh, it's a time to introduce the the tracking marker, the sensor. So. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a kind of a sensor we fabricated in our laboratory, particularly for the 1.5 uh, uh, Tesla MRI machine. Uh, this, this circuit is actually a resonant circuit, can resonate the frequency, uh, the LATMA frequency of 1.5T, which is 36.87 megahertz. Uh, we can pick up the signals very high MRI gradient signals along that three principal directions. So uh, we can even update the, the tracking uh, uh, position very fast. Uh, in the If we are not using the tracking sequence, only the imaging sequence, you can see a very light, bright spot uh, on the imaging slices. So if I so choose some example here, uh, this is the uh, kind of a chopstick integrate with two marker. Uh, we just maneuver the chopstick inside the MRI scanner. You can see the the real time uh, uh, location, the, the lo lo uh, localization here uh, in the portings. Uh, we try to measure the 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 latency, which is within 30 milliseconds only. Uh, so I may not go through this uh, too much. Uh, because it involves a lot of MRI uh, science and principle behind. But the idea is that we have the actuation, we have the checker, we have the sensor, uh, we, we will have a sufficient material to integrate them as a robot. So uh, if talk of, talking about robot, uh, we definitely need to 
uh, think about the application. We can't do all kind of procedure at this moment. Uh, but for the simple robot structure, uh, we, we use a liver RF ablation as an example. So this is a per continuous uh, little invention, intervention approach. So the needle will push it from, from the belly skin. And then based on the MRI monitoring, we you will know you will know how to plan the needle orientation pushing to work to the tumor target. So here we developed a very small handy uh, needle positioner. That needle positioner can be attached on the on the patient uh, uh, belly surface. The idea is that uh, the surgeons can can have a course adjustment after right after the first MRI scan. So suppose the patient has been scanned for one time, we know where is the tumor, uh, and then we we know also know where is the relative position of the robot to the tumor. So when the patient come out, uh, we, we can encode all the orientation of the little guide. So that's why uh, you can see the clinician, when the clinician moving, moving the, 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 the robot base, there's a kind of light signals uh, transferred through the optical fibers. There's a, not an LED because uh, we can't uh, work, uh, operate the LED in the very strong magnetic environment. So this is the light signal uh, the light is transferred through the optical fiber from the control room. So this signal is the kind of knowledge we base on our, our P-op imaging. So based on the imaging, we know where is the tumor. We know the area, how the needle guy is pointing along the tumors. So this is a night signal. We try to guide the surgeons to manage the needle accurate towards the point to work to the target. So the, the uh, uh, a surgeon has to has to fix it and lock it. That may not be accurate. That may not be accurate. But up to when this patient, when the patient uh, go back to the MRI, we have the soft actuator to fine tune uh, the little guide to the right place. That would, could be within five degree uh, that could compensate within five degree error. So with that, uh, with that compensation, the robot will lock again and then allow the surgeons to uh, act confident to push the needle uh, through the uh, through the robot. So uh, there's uh, involve a lot of uh, uh, locking mechanism. Uh, this is another uh, uh, experiment carry out in the MRI environment. So you, you can see the procedure is that suppose the patient being scanned for one time, we know the relative position of the tumor, we know how to do the course adjustment, and then lock it down, and then the robot will push it back to the MRI to perform a real-time MRI scanning. And then once it confirmed, uh, the surgeons can put a needle to the phantom. So unfortunately, we still not yet carry out the uh, uh, animal or cataphoric trial. So hopefully, uh, we will we will be able to to carry out more preclinical validation for this research work. So the next example, another example, uh, we, it will involve more complicated uh, uh, components. Here, uh, I just let you know uh, the application, which is particularly for the uh, transoral nasal surgery. When we talk about the situation without MRI, when, when, when the surgeon, when the clinician uh, discover the tumor very close to the uh, laryngeal regions, uh, close to the vocal muscle regions, uh, they will somehow like to uh, uh, choose the laser ablation the, as a cutting manner, uh, which is because uh, they, 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 they are demanding for very high accuracy. They don't want to, uh, they, they want to have a very thin surgical margins. They don't want to destroy extra uh, excessive, excessively to the uh, nerve, to the vocal, vocal muscle 
which posing a permanent effect to throwing or voice speech uh, performance. So somehow they will have a pre-operative uh, MR image. That means the uh, even before the procedure, uh, the patient uh, uh, will, will be scanned with MRI and look, uh, the tumor can be located uh, very clearly uh, around the regions. And the setting is very complicated. Uh, during the uh, procedure, uh, uh, during the procedure, this patient uh, will be fully sustained uh, uh, under the general as anesthesia, and then they have to maintain a very string stranger's uh, position. That means uh, uh, the, the 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 patient has to maintain a, a very good uh, good access straight line uh, to the to the vocal regions, and then. And then somehow some of the patients some of the, uh, cannot do this, and then but they even the the, the surgeons will apply a lot of uh, tissue oral retraction so as to maintain a strict tunnel that the laser can project out of the uh, patient. So this is the laser laser projector you can see, and then the with uh, uh behind the projector, the 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 uh, surgeons can observe how the laser will be projected on the lesion through the uh, microscopic setting. So this is a very uh, uh, complex uh, settings because somehow uh, the surgeons has to ensure the patient posture is, is good enough for the restrictions and those restrictions can be maintained in a very good straight line, uh, straight line of sight so that the laser can, can properly project it uh, accurately or without any uh, uh, without any obstruction. So uh, that's why, and also the laser has to be uh, cutting very well, and then the, the, the surgeons has to be very experienced to know uh, how much laser should be delivered to the tumor. So that's why uh, with those complications, uh, we thought of a uh, application under the MRI. So we thought about when we have a robot that could be compact enough, anchor mounted on the patients with the flexible endoscope. That flexible endoscope can even guide the optical fiber to the to the uh, uh, laryngeal regions, vocal uh, muscles, and then the endoscope can be even deliver not just the fibers, also the fiber optics camera, which is compatible in the MRI environments. So with those compact settings, uh, under the MRI, we can even monitor the uh, temperature and we, under we would ensure how much energy uh, will be absorbed by the, by the surgical site. So based on that uh, applications, uh, we have, developed this robot. So basically the robot can uh, insert the endoscope uh, by using the hydraulics actuation, hydraulics uh, uh, transmission. The robot endoscope can bend in, in four different directions in a 360, but not that much because we don't need a very sharp bending uh, within, the, within the esophagus. And, and also uh, mostly important is that the tip, uh, uh, the, the laser lens, the laser chronometer can be steered with a very small droplet of water. So we have a three chamber uh, enclosed it within the capsule, within the, within the tip. And then um, we use the laser spot as a sensing feedback. So that's why we have an open loop control, closed loop control. What does it mean closed loop control? Which here is that when we have the sensing feedback based on the sensing error, uh, based on the error through the sensing, we know we know how much the deviation from the from the spot. We can correct it. Uh, the system can correct the trajectory. So here is that uh, the the ablation laser is actually invisible, but only the visible laser, which is which is uh, uh, can be uh, can be acting as a as, as a laser spot, but that visible laser 
is no harm to the tissue. It's just for projection. It's just for landmark. So based on the fiber scope uh, visualize, uh, visual, visualization, we can visualize the uh, laser spot very well. And based on that laser spot, we know how to control. We know how to do the convergence adaptive control so that we can maintain the trajectory in a very accurate uh, manner. So here is an example. You will see uh, the uh, fibers could become the sensor. And then we also carry out the cataphragic trial on the head subjects. And we have the black color, which is the fiber scope, optical fiber scope. And then uh, the the whole subject is transferred to the to the MRI environment. And then you can see the, the surgeons try to prescribe the regions of the ablation uh, interest. So uh, the robot will keep uh, the robot will keep uh, moving. Uh, the, the laser will, will keep following that trajectory. And uh, we even can monitor the temperature and see how much heat energy has been absorbed. So that would be very useful to monitor the ablation progress and, and understand how, how much the depth has been ablated. So this is the somehow before and after the ablation on the ex vivo tissue. Um, so this is the idea why this is that could be a proper application with soft robot, with laser ablation, with MRI, uh, all work out a robot together for a proper applications. So another uh, sensor uh, is we also like to employ or develop, which is the FBG. So here is an example how we would like to put the FBG fiber, which is the optical fiber. I will I will let you see the fibers. Uh, uh, in the letter slide, but here is the idea. We want to make a robot skin based on that FBG sensing. So we employ the uh, finite element analysis along with the AI technology to train up the models. And uh, so this is the fiber architecture actually is thinner than a hair. And then only a, a very small grating uh, graded on the on the fibers. So you can just think about some string gauge uh, integrated along the optical fibers. That optical fibers can be very thin, smaller to the uh, 200 micrometers, uh, very thin, thinner than hair. And then we have a lot of string gauge along the optical fibers. So here is an example and how we convert that FBG to become a robotic skin. So suppose we have the uh, train, uh, rub rubber sheet in an A4 size. We lay the FBG fibers along that uh, dot bone shape layout. And we do a lot of offline uh, uh, training, uh, AI training, deep learning training in the finite element environment. So uh, later on, we also capture some experimental data based on the optical tracker. And then we know the relationship between the string gauge measurement, the, the string measurement and the, and the morphology. So we have the AI mapping to map the FBG string data to the A4 morphology. So you will see, uh, with a very simple uh, sensor without any electronics involved in the in the rubber, we can do a very uh, high performance morphological morphological sensing. So again, without electronics, that means we can put this sensor into MR environment. So that's why we investigate uh, uh, FBG op fiber optics uh, FBG technology. So here you will see uh, the, the sensor, uh, I can't say it's very accurate, but at least you can see the sampling uh, weight it is very high. We try to use uh, some robot to shoot the bullet on the, on the, on the sensor. 
uh, to my memory, my student told me that the maximum error can can just up to five millimeters. This is what the uh, full out they, they found found it in the error analysis. Uh, but I definitely uh, can tell you it's quite depends on the training set and and the finite element analysis, finite element models. So we are keep on using a new method to in, improve the the error. But they are very responsive uh, in terms of the uh, sampling rate. So this is the, a very good candidate in minimally invasive surgery. For example, if we rather than using the single core, if we turn to a more sophisticated optical fiber, that means one single fiber, we have at least seven cores. That means we have a seven parallel cores of the FBG. So with this setting, we can even measure the 3D of a catheter. So uh, some people already use these uh, multiple core fibers to integrate with the uh, uh, fibers to measure the shape of the fiber inside the bodies. So there's a, a, a very one of the killer application in uh, cardiac catheterization procedure, uh, which is so-called the uh, electrophysiology EP, which is the treatment to the heart rhythm disorder arrhythmias. And then again, uh, the catheter need to tran uh, channel through the femoral vein up to the heart chamber and make a puncture to the left atrium and go inside to make a scar on the surface. This is a very perfect scenario uh, because this is just, just an animation, but in, but in the real realistic case, um, the, you can't maintain the, the catheter tip on the inner wall very good. So somehow uh, this is very difficult to quantify the ablation effect or quantify how much the heat energy has been really uh, uh, deliver to the to the to the tissue but however uh, we can't push it too much because uh, if we push it too much and then uh, turn on the ablation too long the perforation will be the risk so uh, I can say uh, perforation uh, is a, really a disaster in in this case so that's why this procedure can be very conservative um, somehow, uh, the the recurrent rate is very high, which is because uh, a lot of ablation is actually not su not sufficient, and then they are just an edema rather than the scar, so that the the tissue can recover well, and then that that part will in the end will transmit the abnormal uh, electrical signal again. So this is not a, not a good uh, idea. That's why uh, some people think about why we don't why we can. Why don't we use the uh, MRI to monitor the ablation? But if we use MRI to monitor the ablation, everything will be very complicated. We, we need to have a robotic catheters. The robot have, has to be safe, operate inside the MRI. We need to have a sophisticated sensor like FBG. We have to detect the curvature in real times, and also we have to register the curvature into the MRI coordinate system. So we need both kind of sensor to perform that procedure. So uh, he's a, he, this is a robot. We can see uh, the robot actually is just a, 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 a ex extension hand. We put that standard uh, clinical used EP catheter, pack it inside to the robot. The robot would drive three degree of freedom, push, uh, rolling the, the catheter and steer the catheter banding. So uh, this is the hydraulic driven robot, totally MRI safe. And here we we did a test and see how the robotics, uh, how the catheter tip can be levigate inside the uh, rubber rubber left atrium. So we simulate the pulsatile fold to that uh, left atrium phantom so that we can see the, the tip is actually adversely affected DV from the from the target. 
So uh, we even put it into the MRI uh, system. So you can see uh, uh, we try to scan a few slides of the MRI and uh, having the marker along the catheter, we know we know the catheter, we also know the catheter curvature with the uh, FBG. And along with two sensing capabilities, we can register the, MR, uh, the catheter uh, tip position into the MRI uh, image domains. So we can actually know the, 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 how, how much uh, the catheter has to be pushed further to, to target that uh, by spot. So, uh, I guess. <laughs> oh, you're, you're coming to the end. Oh, yeah, coming to the end. Okay. So, sorry. Yeah, the, uh, no <laughs> uh, no occasionally. No so, um, sorry, I should have one small slide. I mean, I just deleted. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I deleted. But but this is kind of summary of what our uh, my groups have to do. Um, we focus on the MRI guided robotics. Um, we have our own solution, hydraulics. Uh, actuation system. We we know how to make the robot smaller, and then that could be incorporated with the uh, FBG and the MRI checker. Apart from the uh, MRI, my groups also focus on a lot of interventional endoscopy, flexible endoscope device instrument. But I don't have time to go through this uh, today. But hopefully, uh, you have enjoyed. Uh, the my my presentation here to understand something yeah. about the MRI guided robotics. So I might properly hand over the microphone to Casper and looking forward to your questions. Yeah, it's fantastic. So thank you very much uh, for presenting. Um, a really a fantastic uh, overview. Um, I mean, you started right at the beginning there on, on, on Acrobat and the knee replacement and Da Vinci, and then moved over to the, the, the fantastic advancements on, on your side with the MRI guidance uh, and, of course, incorporating soft uh, aspects there as well. So e excellent. Um, yeah, so there is time for a few questions. Um, if anyone has a question, please let me know. And you can either type it in the chat or just open your microphone. And we have Paolo Fiorini coming. Hi, Paolo. Give us a few, give us a few more minutes. Uh, sure, 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 sure. I just uh, connected uh, just to be here. Yep, fantastic. So Kawai just uh, presented and um, we just opened the floor for questions, but maybe I can start. Um, so you you have decided to develop hydraulic systems for your MRI guided robotic systems and um, wanted to know how these compare to other approaches where people use piezo electric motors and whether you have some problems especially considering that you have very long um, uh, lines hydraulic lines to bring the pressure to the um, to the robot yeah, uh, there's always a pros and cons. Uh, the advantage of using hydraulics is that you you don't need to stop the robot. You can you can imaging the the robot, even the robot is being operate operate. But you, if we use the piezo electric, we have to schedule the robot operation with the uh, imaging in a very good schedule. So we have to interleave the robot motion with the uh, 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 with the uh, imagings. So uh, this is one of the advantage over the piezo electric. But uh, to be fair, the disadvantage is that uh, uh, we have to put much effort, or or the, the size will be bigger than the uh, the motor size will be bigger than the uh, piezo electric. And then we have to ensure seal leakage of the water. Um, so, uh, also the dynamics performance of the hydraulics will be much better because the piezo electric is worked out as a step, stepper motor. So somehow the dynamics may not be enough for some procedure, even a kind of uh, so-called the uh, LCM motion, but that has to be operated in a very slow manner. So in general, um, uh, to to us, the problem is that uh, you we have to maintain a a a 
the linear uh, properties of the uh, transmission uh, without any linkage, leakage of the water. Yep. And what, what about the transmission delays? Any delays on the long lines? Wouldn't that also impact on the dynamic yep. performance? Yeah, 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 yeah. This this is a very good question. Uh, yes, this is a delay there. Um, we for 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 example that kind of hydraulics motor with the op optimum optimum uh, frequency range. I mean the operating frequency range, which is around uh, seven to eight hertz. Um, so that that means that um, uh, it can't be too too uh, the the change of the motion can't be too fast. Which is because the uh, elasticity of the pipelines. So we already use a very rigid uh, materials, main, maintain the rigidity of the pipelines. So this is the main major source of the uh, nonlinear uh, latency, transmission, transmitter latency. But for many uh, applications here, even uh, in this video, uh, even we we talk about the um, seven to eight hertz. Uh, uh, operating range. Uh, maybe in this video, 10 meter hydraulics pipelines, you may not easy to find the, the delay uh, in between the master and the slave unit. Okay, um, thank you. Um, maybe I can continue with a few more questions. Um, I, I liked your, your bellow sheath that you introduced to, I think, uh, be able to apply more pressures to your system, and this this sheath seems to be capable of contracting and and expanding quite well. So you you, you reached 450 mm -hmm. grams. Do you think that is sufficient? And the other question is, how does that compare to um, tools, standard tools made from steel? Okay, so uh, standard. Tools, you mean the uh, reinforcement? You mean straight, straight line laparoscopic tools, for example? Oh, okay. Uh, for endoscope, uh, we, we try to compare to the endoscope. Okay. Honestly, uh, uh, in terms of, I, I don't know much. Uh, we, we, have, we have a thought about how we can use this robot prototype to apply it as an endoscope. For for colonoscopy or uh, upper GI and en uh, endoscopy, um, honestly, what we observe is that uh, even the colonoscopy they they require quite an amount of force mm. uh, to particularly for for patient they contain more fat, they need some more force. Um, I'm not so sure this robot will be fairly enough to to comparable to the uh. To the clinical use the endoscope, um, but the but this is an in interesting uh, uh, finding. Not just only the bellow shift. I I guess the bellow shift is. I'm not the first one to to propose using the bellow shift. I guess the uh, 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 uh in ITT I, I I remember they also published a paper I'll talk about the the bellow reinforcement. Uh, in this one, we propose to integrate a proper spring along the cent central line, so as to uh, enhance the hysteresis to eliminate the the backlash of the robot. Along, uh, but the problem is that uh, we, if we put six point five bar pressure into the body, um, I'm not so sure. Uh, the safety regula regulatory people will think about it. But honestly, we also did a lot of stress tests. Even uh, even we try to burst the robot. Uh, it doesn't like the effect of balloon. The balloon have, has an explosion effect. But here, uh, we, we, we punch the needles onto the robot. Actually, the, the gas is leaking out gradually not like an explosion okay. uh, effect. So I guess it's, it's quite safe, honestly, but uh, but we don't know how to ensure we, we will pushing something in a very high pressure into the human body. So that's why um, we didn't continue uh, to use it for, for the uh, medical applications. 
uh, but you probably can share some of your insights because I know you also have some uh, soft robots uh, tested in the uh, uh, clinical environment. So this is somehow um, yeah. I can I can answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I no, I take all your points. Um, I, I like this sheath, and I mean, I I haven't seen it before. And what I what I like particularly about it is that it can compact so well. Because we we had also a sheath on the outside in, in earlier prototypes of our um, stiff lop robot in our project uh, many years ago, and yeah. um, it 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 was good in keeping it all together. That was good. Uh, we could increase the pressure and and the the forces that we could apply to the environment, but it became more rigid the whole structure. So this mm -hmm. compaction. Uh, element was yeah um, lost in a way. Yeah, so. yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, the 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 surface is no longer very soft, although they have a soft robot behavior. And also another advantage of using Balo here is that we found that uh they provide a very good stability on the torsion transmission because you know somehow this robot with three chamber in parallel, they they may be twisted by themselves somehow. Uh, there's a kind of Nonlinear properties uh, along the structure, but that Balo can provide a very good uh, uh, reinforcement on along the torsional uh, direction. Okay, yeah, good point. Yeah. Good. I mean, I would like to continue talking for quite a bit with you, but unfortunately, we we don't have the um, the time. Um, um, yeah, Paolo is 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 already here. And um, so thank you very much again for for you know, giving that presentation. Would you be also okay to provide us with your uh, slides? Because then I could upload that onto our internal website. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So I will let you, uh, I will let you, uh, I give you the download link later on. Fantastic. Good. Yeah, thank you very much again.